In Jerusalem, around AD 30, Jesus died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, and then ascended into heaven. Fifty days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit fell on the apostles, giving them power, purpose, and a plan. Out of joy, the church was born. Empowered by the Spirit, Peter gave his first sermon, and 3,000 hearts were transformed. Hearing, receiving, and repenting, the young church walked in unity and garnered praise. Out of joy, the gospel creates community. Peter and John then continued to spread the gospel through preaching and miracles, and the church grew by 5,000. In AD 31, Stephen gave a powerful sermon connecting the Old Testament to Jesus and rebuking the people for their hard hearts. Enraged, the people stoned Stephen, making him the first Christian martyr. In AD 34, the gospel continued to multiply through Philip's ministry in Samaria and Caesarea. Meanwhile, on the road to Damascus, the Lord transformed the heart of Saul, a man who persecuted countless Christians, and Saul began to go by Paul. After this conversion, the gospel continued to spread through the ministries of Paul and Peter. God gave Peter a vision and used him to first reach the Gentiles. In AD 44, King Herod Agrippa I executed the Apostle James and had Peter arrested, but an angel rescued Peter, leading him out of the prison. As the believers were scattered because of persecution, the center of operations for Christianity turned from Jerusalem to Antioch, where many teachers and prophets gathered. Around AD 48, Paul and Barnabas were then called out to go on their first missionary journey. Many Jews and Gentiles believed after hearing the word preached, while others drove Paul and Barnabas out of the cities. In every day and age, the church faces both persecution and praise because all multiplication comes at a cost. But we must fight for and pray for unity to flourish within the church. To advance the gospel, we must be shaped by the gospel. We must be prayerful and open-handed. We must continue to move forward for the good of the church and the sake of the gospel. We must remember that because of God's grace, the church is unstoppable. Well, good morning. Welcome back to another service here at the Chapel Nordonia. Uh, my name is Chase, and I'm one of the church planters here on our team of church planters in Nordonia. So glad that you're here uh, to worship with us this morning. Uh, we are in week 10 of a 15-week series through the book of Acts. And, and so that recap video that we just saw right there, hopefully uh, it's keeping us up to date with everything that's going on in this series. And, and uh, as we seek to, to launch this church here in Nordonia, uh, what we've been doing is we've been really looking and, and checking out the, the launch or the birth of the, the church, the early church. And so we see that in the book of Acts. And, and what we've been seeing over and over again is, is that even though there's hardships and, and clashes and, and even persecution, like Amanda says at the end of that video each week, the church is unstoppable. And so this week, we're going to continue our series uh, through the book of Acts. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open to uh, Acts chapter 15. Uh, that's where we're going to be. But actually, when you open to Acts 15, stick something in there and then turn to, to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. We're kind of going to be going back and forth uh, between Acts 15 and Romans 5 this morning. And, and while you're turning there, let me just uh, remind you that... Uh, I want to invite anyone who wants to come for our live recording next week. So last week we had our uh, first half of our home groups come for the in-person recording here. And this week we've got uh, the other half of the home group. So those of you who are here in person, thank you uh, for being here. But next week we want to invite anyone else that wants to come uh, to be here for this live recording. But here's the caveat. Uh, we're going to need your help to tear down when we're done. So we need your help uh, to tear down. Now, you might be thinking, you know, I can't lift heavy things or, or you don't know me. I'm kind of clumsy. I'm going to break something. Well, don't worry. There's uh, things that do not take a lot of, uh, they're, they're, they're not very heavy to lift them and, and they're not very fragile. Uh, so we can use all the hands that we can get and lunch uh, will be provided. And so that's next week. And then the following week, March 28th, 
uh, is the day that, Lord willing, we will all regather in person. So we're looking forward to that. But like we've been saying each week, we're regathering. We're not reopening because the church, we haven't stopped. And so the Lord has been continuing to, to grow our church and to use us over this last year. Uh, but we are looking forward to when we're getting back together. All right, with that said, if your Bible's open to Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, I'm going to start reading in verse 12. Uh, we here at the chapel, we almost always use the, the ESV, the English Standard Version. Uh, but, but this morning, just for when I read this passage here, uh, we're going to read from the NLT, the New Living Translation. So I'm going to read Romans chapter 5, starting in verse 12. Here we go. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And then jump down to verse 20. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through the righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. What does any of this have to do with the book of Acts? Well, let's pray, and then we'll talk about it. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can learn more about you, and you can teach us more about us. That's exactly what I pray for in these moments. Lord, I pray that I might become less, that you might become greater. Will you speak through me? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O oh Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's no secret that the last 12 months have been ripe with division, right? Whether we're talking about uh, a racial division or, or political division or even theological division, you name it, whatever category you give, uh, I'm sure someone disagrees over something. In fact, I'm sure maybe someone's tuning in right now disagreeing with me over the fact that everyone disagrees about everything. Well, I believe that one of the leading causes for division in our nation and, and in our culture today is that uh, we often use uh, words, we use certain words, but we're using them differently. And that's not the, the root of our division, right? If we're followers of Christ, then we know that the root of our division is sin. But, but one of the reasons that we can't seem to agree on anything, other than the fact that we can't agree on anything, is because we're often using the same words, but we're using them completely different. And so as a result, we can't seem to get along. But one of those words that's often uh, misused differently by different people and therefore misunderstood is the word woke. Right? Whether we're uh, not a frequent uh, visitor to social media or whether we are, I'm sure that many of us over the last couple years, for better or for worse, have become well acquainted with the term woke and the phrase stay woke. And according to Webster's Dictionary, the phrase, stay woke, it can be traced back to a song from 2008, and it's around that time that the phrase, uh, to quote Webster's Dictionary, uh, stay woke became a watchword in parts of the black community for those who were self-aware, questioning the dominant paradigm, and striving for something better. In recent years, the, the word has become uh, a word that's used by many to talk about the, the realities uh, of injustice, and, and it's turned into a, an action word where activists are called woke, and they encourage other people to, to stay woke, and, and like just about everything else uh, in the church, people's feelings about the word and phrase differ greatly depending on, on who you're talking to. 
right? Some people see the word as a word that they used to call the church into action and talk about the awakening of the realities to injustice, and they use it as a way to call the church to speak into those actions. Pastor Eric Mason, a church planter in Philadelphia, uh, he says that the church should utilize the mind of Christ and redeem the term, and he uses it to mean being awakened uh, from the dead end and sinful thinking, because like the book of Ephesians tells us, every believer uh, has been awakened from sin's effect and Satan's deceptions. And others tie the word uh, directly to the, the anti-God agenda of certain uh, politicians and certain movements, and, and there's a time and a place for that debate, but this morning I'm titling the message, Stay Woke Fan. And it's uh, coincidentally the, uh, the title of my family's group text thread. But, but this morning, like Pastor Eric Mason, uh, my usage of this term, which will become obvious in just a few minutes, has nothing to do with any political or, or sociological frameworks in our culture or in our church. But it has everything to do with, with a reality to which we all need to awaken to a reality that goes against the dominant paradigm of our culture and even against uh, the dominant worldview of our churches, and it's a reality that once realized will allow us to strive for something much, much better. And what I'm talking about this morning is the reality of grace. And for many, the, the term grace also can carry with it a lot of different meanings. For some, the, the word grace has little more to do than, than just the, the little prayer you say before food comes out. But no, grace, it simply means unearned, or unmerited favor. I'm not a huge fan of that definition. I'll, I'll tell you why in a little bit. But, but understanding the, the true meaning of grace, namely the, the grace that God has lavished on us in sending his one and only son, Jesus, to die in our place, and understanding and responding to that grace is absolutely crucial to what it means to be a Christian. Pastor Chuck Swindoll, in his book uh, called Grace Awakening, Grace Awakening, to which I owe uh, a great portion of this uh, sermon this morning. In fact, even the title is kind of closely related there. Uh, Pastor Chuck Swindoll, in this, in this great book, uh, which I want to encourage, I know I recommend a lot of books, but this uh, was probably the, the most influential book I read during my time in seminary. It changed my life. Uh, but this book, Grace Awakening, uh, Chuck Swindoll, he defines grace this way. He says, grace is to extend favor or kindness to one who doesn't deserve it and can never earn it. Receiving God's acceptance by grace always stands in sharp contrast to earning it on the basis of works. Every time the thought of grace appears, there is the idea of it being undeserved. In no way is the recipient getting what he or she deserves. Okay, so, so grace is, is getting what we don't deserve. And this, this is good news because the book of Romans chapter 3 tells us that we're all sinners. And so as a result, since we've all sinned, we're all deserving of death. See, when we compare ourselves to others, uh, especially those who are outside of the church, it's, it might be easy for us to think pretty highly of ourselves. But when we start comparing ourselves to God's standard and God's perfect standard of perfection, then we realize that there's no way that we can live up to that standard, and we realize how far we've fallen short, and then we realize just how much in need we are of grace. I brought this quick little illustration here. This is a little tykes basketball hoop. And uh, a little while ago, just out of curiosity, I decided to look up and see what kind of qualities uh, NBA scouts look for. And so I looked and I found, I saw that the NBA scouts, what they look for are uh, shooting and scoring capabilities, ball handling, defense capabilities, and passing capabilities. Okay, now, now I'm, not, I'm not even going to try and brag. Uh, I'm a beast on the little tykes hoop, all right? And, and so the little tykes hoop, right, what was the first one? It said uh, uh, scoring capabilities. Here we go. That would have been so embarrassing if I missed that. But I can make those kind of shots all day, right? I can do uh, dunks on the little tyke soup. This is about the size of a, of a grapefruit, so I can have great ball handling skills with the, the little tyke soup. But, but that's not worth bragging about, is it? Why? Because it's a little tyke soup, right? I'm about twice the size of that thing, so it's, it's not that impressive. The thought of an NBA scout watching me play on this little tyke soup and being so impressed that he calls me to, to join the Cavs because of what I can do on this hoop is absolutely absurd. Listen to me, thinking that we've earned God's favor from a salvific standpoint because of our good works is like me thinking that an NBA scout is going to be impressed with my basketball ability 
on a little tyke suit. And that's why the prophet Isaiah tells us that, that all of our best efforts and our, all of our labors are just like filthy rags in the sight of God. But that's where grace comes in. Because grace says that God, knowing that we couldn't measure up to his standard of perfection, he sent his son. And so now when Jesus looks at us, when we're, when we're in Christ, he doesn't see our, our little tyke's effort, but no, he sees the perfection and the holiness of his son. And again, in this wonderful book, uh, uh, Grace Awakening, Pastor Chuck Swindoll breaks down uh, really the meaning of grace, and he makes a distinction between what's called vertical grace, our relationship between God and man, and then also uh, horizontal grace, the grace that we extend to one another. And what's remarkable is that in Acts chapter 15, the part of the story that we're coming to today, in Acts chapter 15, we see some of the biggest lessons in all of Scripture regarding both kinds of grace, both vertical grace and horizontal grace. And like I said earlier, uh, what, what's taught in this chapter goes against the dominant paradigm of our culture and even our churches. And so my hope for this morning is that the Lord will work in our hearts and awaken us to a new and deeper understanding of grace. And that we will all, in a way, stay woke in this graceless world that we live in. So what I want to do this morning is, is quickly uh, explain the context of Acts 15, what's going on that makes it so important to talk about grace, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the vertical grace. We won't have time to get to the, the horizontal grace this morning. We'll save that for, for next week. But if your Bible's still open to Acts, uh, Acts chapter 15, remember I said keep a, a pen or a paper or something in Acts 15 and Romans 5, because we're kind of going to be jumping back and forth. But I want to read this morning starting in verse 1 of Acts chapter 15. Here's what it says. It says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. Okay, so, so what's going on? Well, from the very first word here in Acts chapter 15, we know right away that there's a problem, right? Because if you remember last week, the story ended on a positive note. Paul and Barnabas uh, were, were fasting and praying and sharing about all the great things that happened during their missionary journey. But then it says, but, right? Anytime you're reading biblical narrative and, and something great happened, and then you come to the word, but you can just know that, that something is about to go downhill, that something bad's about to happen. And that's exactly what we see here as these men from Judea start coming to teach uh, a message that contradicts with the message of Paul and Barnabas. Who are these men? Well, traditionally they're called the Judaizers. It's a name given to them by Paul in the book of Galatians, they're also known as the, uh, the circumcision party in Acts 11, uh, which you can tell right by the name that they're probably not a fun group of people to be around, right? If someone's running for office and that's the party they're running with, uh, they're probably not going to get a lot of popular votes. But, but what happens is, is the, the circumcision party, uh, as their name would suggest, is going around telling people that they can't be saved unless they, they follow certain aspects of the Mosaic law. Now, this is huge. Okay, because remember what's been going on the past few chapters is that the gospel has gone from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and the gospel's made its way to the, the Gentiles and now they're in Antioch and that's the, where the center of the church is and, and the majority of the people who, who uh, came to have saving faith in Jesus, they didn't grow up in Jewish households or, or following Jewish traditions and so this was offending those who were called the Judaizers. And so Paul and Barnabas they go to Jerusalem to meet up with the other apostles and discuss the matter. And as a side note, uh, this is what's referred to as the Jerusalem Council. Okay, that's the, the first uh, official church council. If you know church history, you know, there's all sorts of church councils. There was the Council of Nicaea and the, and the Council of Constantinople and several other church councils. And, and out of most of those councils came certain creeds. And, and that's actually why we started this morning by uh, reciting the Apostles' Creed. Uh, the Apostles' Creed wasn't written during the Jerusalem Council, and it actually wasn't even written by the Apostles, but uh, the, the Apostles' Creed encapsulates the beliefs of all the men who were gathered there uh, in the early church at the Council of Jerusalem in 49 AD. So what happened at this council? Well, look at verse 6. It says, The Apostles and the Elders were gathered together to consider this matter. 
What matter were they considering? Do you need to follow Jewish customs and traditions to be saved? In verse 7, And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. He's talking about the events in, in Acts chapter 10 when God had showed Peter that uh, the gospel was going to go to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10, uh, around this time in the story, had taken place about 10 or 11 years earlier. And so it was the early days of the church, verse 8. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their heart by faith. Now, therefore... Why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? What's he talking about? What's this yoke that's been placed on them? He's talking about uh, the law, right? right? The, the law in its entirety, the, the Mosaic law, which Peter points out, cannot be kept perfectly. And then Paul comes to this conclusion here in verse 11, uh, which really reads like a, a statement of faith or a creed almost. Uh, verse 11. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And what's amazing is those are the last words of Peter that we see here in the book of Acts. Uh, Peter would go on to, uh, to, to write two books of the New Testament, First and Second Peter. According to, to church history, Peter would later join up with Paul, and together they'd, they'd plant the church in Rome. And about 15, 16 years after these events here, spoiler alert, Paul and Peter were both going to be executed by the emperor Nero. And according to church tradition, it's not in the Bible, but according to church uh, historians in the early church, uh, Peter actually requested to be crucified upside down because he didn't feel like he was worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus. And so what's remarkable is that this man who had had this this face-to-face -face interaction with Jesus. If you know the story about Peter, as he, as he denied Jesus three times and Jesus restored him, he got a firsthand taste of God's grace. And we see him end his portion of the book of Acts by just becoming an unashamed proponent of grace. And so for the rest of our time together, I just want to dig deeper uh, into our understanding of grace and see how uh, th this idea of, of specifically vertical grace plays out in our lives because, because grace was the core issue there at the Council of Jerusalem, wasn't it? Right? The, the false teachers couldn't accept the fact that, that they contribute nothing to their own salvation except for the sin that makes their salvation necessary. They couldn't accept the reality that they were saved by grace and grace alone. They wanted to add these components to the law and say, no, no you have to do this, you have to do that in order to be saved. You, they, they were trying to earn their ticket to heaven, and the same argument is all throughout the early church, and it's also seen all throughout our churches today. And I don't think the majority of us in our church or in our community are, are struggling with whether we need to keep certain portions of the Old Testament law today. Like, I don't think any of us uh, have, have woken up recently just, just burdened by the fact that we're not properly observing uh, certain Jewish religious festivals or, or the purification rituals of the Old Testament. I mean, uh, the, the circumcision party, the Judaizers, they are alive and well in our culture today. Don't get me wrong. The, the name has just simply changed. Uh, now they're called the, the, the Hebrew Roots Movement, or uh, in, in the uh, minority culture, the, the Black Hebrew Israelites. Both uh, are groups that say that we as the church need to uh, do better at just basically throw out the whole New Testament and follow the Old Testament law. It's a belief that is alive and well today. In fact, a uh, quick side story, uh, Valmir Soares and I were at breakfast earlier this week, and uh, this lady overheard us talking. She was a really nice lady. Valmir, if you don't know, is, is part of our core team here in Nordonia. And this lady came up to us and was telling us about why we needed to, to follow Old Testament law. And she was letting us know that she was uh, a Hebrew Israelite. Okay, so, so this belief that we still need to follow the Old Testament law is very alive in our society today. I don't want don't to downplay it. But, but while I don't think that many of us in, in our church specifically uh, have that exact same struggle that we see here in the book of Jerusalem, we still struggle with the root of the problem. The root is the same. And the reality that we all need to wake up to this morning and encourage others to wake up to is the reality of the extent of the vertical grace that's offered to us all. Let me read another quote from uh, Chuck Swindoll's Grace Awakening. 
He says this, he says, like it or not, we are absolutely bankrupt without eternal hope, without spiritual merit. We have nothing in ourselves that gives us favor in the eyes of our holy and righteous heavenly father. So there's nothing we can earn that would cause him to raise his eyebrow and say, now maybe you deserve eternal life with me. No way. In fact, the individual whose track record is morally pure has no better chance at earning God's favor than the individual who has made a wreck and waste of his life and is currently living in unrestrained disobedience. Everyone who hopes to be eternally justified must come to God the same way on the basis of grace. Let me read that one more time. Everyone who hopes to be eternally justified must come to God the same way on the basis of grace. It is a gift. And that gift comes to us absolutely free. Any other view of salvation is heresy, plain and simple. Any other view of salvation apart from grace is, is heresy. And that's why we started this morning reading from the book of, of Romans, because the, the book of Romans is Paul's uh, magnum opus, if you will. It's, it's his most comprehensive uh, explanation of the gospel. It's his, his most extensive work on the idea and topic of grace. And, and in the book of Romans, you can turn back there, if you will, uh, to Romans chapter 5. Uh, in the book of Romans, uh, we see Paul traces this story of the Bible from creation all the way to Jesus all the while highlighting the, suffi the sufficiency and the necessity of grace. And he starts at the beginning. Why? Because the beginning of the Bible tells us that in the beginning, God created everything. Humanity was living in a perfect fellowship with God, but then sin it disrupted that perfect union with God. How? Well, look again at Romans chapter 5, verse 12. I'll read it from the ESV this time. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. What is that saying? It's saying that, that through one man's sin, through, through Adam's sin, sin entered the world, and, and when sin entered the world, there was no longer peace, there was no longer perfect union with God. And what Paul is trying to get us to see, this is absolutely huge, what Paul is trying to get us to see is that not only is, is our physical death that we experience uh, as humanity a result of Adam's sin, but, but all of us, by nature, we're all innately guilty, and that guilt is tied back all the way to Adam's sin. And if you say, that's not fair, right? I wasn't the one that sinned in the garden, let me break it to you this way, you know, you would have done the same thing. And so now it's like a spiritual birth defect that we all carry. But look at verse 13. Now I know this is, this is heavy theological information. It's going to tie together in a second. Verse 13, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one to come. So, so what's he saying? He's saying uh, th that death is a result of Adam's sin, right? Death is a result of Adam's sin, but yet the, the law didn't come until Moses. There was a lot of time between Adam and Moses, but yet people were still dying in between Adam and Moses. So what does that tell us? It tells us that death is not just a result of us disobeying the Mosaic law, but no, our death, the death that we experience, the death that everyone who has ever lived and ever will live will experience is tied back all the way to that spiritual birth defect that we all have. So, so we don't struggle with sin because we disobey the law. No, our, 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 the, the root of our sin, it's tied all the way back to that original sin of Adam. And there's nothing that we can do about it on our own. That's, that's the really bad news. Right? That, that this spiritual birth defect is enough to, to eject us from God's presence forever. But look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more uh, have the grace of God and the free gift of grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of the one man's sin. So this, this free gift is unlike the original sin of Adam. How? We'll keep reading. For, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. What, what is he talking about? This is, this is the gospel in a nutshell, okay? This is the good news of Jesus that, that, that Adam disobeyed the law, and as a result of Adam disobeying the law, death entered the world. 
Well, Jesus obeyed the law, and as a result of him obeying the law, Jesus was killed, and as a result of his death, now we can experience life. His death brings life for us all. It's it's the word that Paul uses in Romans chapter 3, the big, long, hard word, propitiation. It's not a word that we use very often, but it's a word that means uh, to appease the wrath of God. And so what Paul is telling us all throughout the book of Romans is that that Jesus in his perfect life, death, and resurrection, he appeased the wrath of God that was directed at us. And so now as a result, we can be justified, which means we can be made right with God. Not, Not because of anything that we did to earn it, but because Jesus did what Adam couldn't do. And now we, the ones with with spiritual defects, our spiritual birth defects are covered by the perfection of Jesus. We get to reap his benefits, and that's called grace. Let me read one more quote from uh, Chuck Swindoll in Grace Awakening. There's no slide this time, but listen. And and if you kind of got lost in the weeds there in Romans, tune back in right now, because this really captures the magnitude of vertical grace. Here it goes. Uh, Chuck Swindoll, he says this, he says, let's imagine that you have a six-year-old son who you love dearly. Tragically, one day you discover that your son was horribly murdered. Okay, this is intense. Like, put yourself in this situation. Don't just let these words, uh, like, pass by you. Really think about being in this situation. Your son is, is killed. After a lengthy search, the investigator of the crime finds the killer. You have a choice. If you used every means in your power to kill the murderer for his crime, that would be vengeance. If, however, you're content to sit back and let the legal authorities take over and execute on him what's a proper, fair trial, a plea of guilty, and maybe even capital punishment, that is justice. But if you should plead for the pardon of your, mur- of your son's murderer, forgive him, completely invite him to live in your home, and adopt him as your own son, That's grace. Just think about that for a second. The the person who who horribly, brutally murdered your your, your son, not an accident, but but this wicked, cruel, evil act, your son who, who had his whole life in front of him, the son who you loved with every fiber of your being, to forgive his killer, just to forgive him would be an act of God and an act of mercy. But but to adopt the killer into your family, that's that's crazy. But is that not the incredible grace that God has lavished on us that we should be called children of God? Not, not, the, not to just be forgiven, but to be adopted into his family. It's the incredible grace of God. Because it was, it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. It it was my sin that drove the nails into his hand. It was my sin that drove the nails into his feet. It was my sin that drove the spear into his side. And yet somehow I get to be included in God's family. That's grace. And if it seems unfair, then you're absolutely right. That's why I said earlier that I don't really like the definition of grace as being just uh, unmerited favor because that's that's true, but it just seems so, so dry. You don't feel the weight of it. But when we're awakened to the extent of of the vertical grace that's been poured out on us, that should change everything about us. First of all, it should obliterate uh, any notion that Christianity is just a system of do's and don'ts. Right? Most people, even many people who call themselves Christians inside the church, we see Christianity not through the lens of grace, but we see Christianity through the lens of what's called moralistic therapeutic deism. I know it's a, a lot of words, but, but basically it's the belief that, that uh, we should try to be on our best behavior and try to live by most biblical principles, at least the ones that are culturally relevant, because one, it's going to offer us a better way to life, and two, if there is a God, then we want that God to be happy with us at the end of our life so that if there is a heaven, we can get into heaven. Right, right? That, that's the, that's how, what most people think about uh, as Christianity, but that's not the gospel, that's just a twisted version of, the, of what the Judaizers were preaching 2,000 years ago. That's not good news. And again, any belief system that claims that we can earn our way to heaven or that there's any other salvation other than grace, that's heresy. And uh, I want to talk specifically to our, our chapel kids or any uh, teens or preteens that are, that are tuning in right now. And this is especially 
important for, for you to understand because what you need to realize is that, that, that the system of rules that your parents have set in place in your house, they're important. And you should follow those rules because the Bible tells us to obey our parents. I'm sure parents are amening right now. But it's so important for you to realize that the rules themselves that, that your parents have set in place, those rules that are, are for your own benefit and that, they've placed in, in, that they've put in place for your benefit, those rules themselves are not Christianity. And parents, this is why it's so important for us in our rule setting that we teach our kids that while we set certain ground rules and we want them to follow those ground rules, those rules themselves are not the gospel. I've seen many men and women walk away from their faith in Jesus because they equated Christianity to the rigid rules that they were asked to follow. And so for them, Christianity just became synonymous with what you can or can't wear. wear. It, it became synonymous with what you can or can't watch. It became synonymous with what you should or shouldn't say. And so what we need to realize is that this is a graceless gospel. And a graceless gospel is a contradiction. No, the gospel should be freeing. It should cause us to realize that we're, when we're in Christ, there's absolutely nothing that we can do. There's nothing that anyone can do to take us out of the grasp of God because our salvation wasn't even our own doing in the first place. It was God's. To quote John MacArthur, we, we can't lose our salvation because if we could lose our salvation, we would. We didn't do anything to get it in the first place. See, I used to fear dying in sin and not, not as an unbeliever, but I used to have this fear that, you know, what if I accidentally uh, told a lie or, or was, had an outburst of anger and then, you know, died in a car accident and I didn't get to repent for that sin that I committed, uh, th then is that sin going to erase my name from the book of life? And I know many other people struggle with the same thought. Like, what if we don't have the time to repent for certain sins? And what we need to realize is that that mentality is a graceless gospel. Now, Hebrews 10, 14 tells us that by a single offering, Jesus perfected for all time those who are being sanctified for all time so you can rest in God's grace. So, so does this mean that we just have a license to do absolutely anything that we want? Well, if your Bible's still open to Romans, look at Romans chapter 6, verse 1. It says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Okay, so, so Paul, what's he saying? He's, he's saying that uh, if God's grace is so great, then, then should we just keep sinning? So should we just keep sinning and then we can ask for forgiveness later, right? We can uh, sin as much as we want because we just want to use up the most of God's grace. Is that what we should do? We'll look at verse 2. By no means. The Greek word is meganinto, or uh, I looked it, uh, up at what it means in a, in, in a Greek dictionary. That phrase, it means God forbid, certainly not, by no means, not at all, no way, never, absolutely not. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I added that last one. But what Paul's saying is he's going on to say that, of course, we can't just abuse God's grace. That would be what we call cheap grace, and that's not how grace works. But no, the reality of grace should actually cause us to live more like Jesus. Of course, when we talk about the subject of grace, there are those who will, by nature, just want to gravitate to misusing it and thinking that, okay, we have this grace. We can now live however we want. It doesn't matter if we follow any rules in Scripture because of God's grace. Well, I love this comment by Martin Lloyd-Jones about Romans 6. This is a kind of a lengthy quote, but I'm going to read it in its entirety. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones is someone who, let's just say the last thing he would be accused of is uh, causing too much freedom for people. But here's what he says. He says, the true preaching of the gospel of salvation by grace alone always leads to the possibility of this charge being brought against it, the charge that, that, that grace can be misused. There is no better test as to whether a man is really preaching the New Testament gospel of salvation than this, that some people might misunderstand it and misinterpret it to mean that it really amounts to this, that because you are saved by grace alone, it does not matter at all what you do you can go on sinning as much as you like because it will contribute all the more to the glory of grace. He says, if a man preaches justification by works, no one would ever raise the question. If a man is preaching, uh, if you want to be Christians, then if you want to go to heaven, you must stop committing sins. You must take up good works. And if you do so regularly and constantly and do not fail to keep on it, you will make yourselves Christians and you will go to heaven. He would never be liable to this misunderstanding. And then the last part, 
Uh, he says, I would say to all preachers, if your preaching of salvation has not been misunderstood in that way, then you have better examine your sermons again. And you better make sure that you're really preaching the salvation that's offered in the New Testament. So I understand that it's, it's risky for us to teach about grace because a uh, sinful mankind, right, it's in our nature that we innately want to swing into one of two ca- uh, chasms. Right? Either we, like the Pharisees, Pharisees, we want to swing all the way to one side, and the, like the Judaizers in Acts chapter 15, and, and we want to try and turn faith, turn Christianity, into a system of rules so that we can somehow think that we contributed our own way to heaven, or we'll swing all the way to the other side. And we'll say, hey, we can just live however we want. But neither of those are the gospel. And the gospel says, I can't live a certain way in order to be made right. But it's because I've been made right that I should want to live a certain way. But the gospel says, nothing in my hand I bring. I, I contributed nothing, but simply to the cross I cling, which in other words, I should want to run after Jesus. Just earlier when we were singing King of Kings, it struck me that, that, that that's how that song starts, isn't it? It, it, it says, in the, in the darkness we were waiting with, without hope and without light. Until heaven came running, there was mercy in your eyes. See, we, we didn't contribute anything. God came chasing after us. And this, this gospel of grace is crucial for us to understand. And this understanding of of vertical grace, it goes in stark contrast to our culture and even to many of our churches. And it's this understanding of grace that not only do we need to be awakened to, but we should make, we should long to see others awakened to as well. One final story, and then we'll be done. Uh, On January 1st, January 1st, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation. The proclamation stated that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforward uh, shall be freed. It will be another two years before the 13th Amendment was finally ratified and slavery uh, was officially legally abolished. And even then, uh, word didn't get to the last slaves to be freed until six months later on June 19th in Galveston, Texas, and, and, and President Lincoln, uh, he was killed only five days at the, after the end of the Civil War, so he didn't even get to see the, the words of his proclamation become a reality for everyone, but soon the words were ringing out everywhere, slavery is abolished. Slavery is abolished. But that's not the end of the story. We like to imagine that there was a party on every plantation and the slave quarters uh, where we're free and it, was, and it was great. But in reality, the majority of the ex-slaves struggled greatly in the days that immediately followed their freedom. The freed slaves were often neglected by their old owners and, and even the, the Union soldiers and, the, and they couldn't get jobs. And so they, they faced extreme poverty as a result and, and they faced all sorts of rampant diseases, including uh, horrific outba- outbreaks of smallpox and cholera. And many of the, sla- the, the ex-slaves just simply starved to death. And, and it was brutal. In fact, some historians estimate that as many as one million freed slaves either died or suffered critical illness by just 1870. And it was considered the largest biological crisis of the 19th century. And so as a result, many of the men and women who had been granted their freedom chose to continue living as though nothing had changed. And so all throughout the Reconstruction period, many of the the freed blacks in the South continued to live as though nothing had changed. In fact, one slave was, uh, former slave was interviewed after the Emancipation Proclamation and asked about his thoughts. And he famously said, he said, I don't know nothing about Abraham Lincoln, except they say he set us free, but I don't know nothing about that either. So so how sad is that, that that an entire war had been fought, a president had been assassinated, uh, an amendment had been made to the Constitution, and it had been signed into law that these men and women and children were legally free, but instead they chose to remain in bondage. Essentially, the system from which they were freed had become a system that they couldn't break away from. 
Well, friends, as sad a reality as it is that those individuals didn't get to taste in the joys of the true freedom that was offered to them, that's exactly what we see happening in our churches today. That our great emancipator, Jesus Christ, has paid the ultimate price to free us from the bondage of sin and death, yet yet many Christians, we just go on living like we're still in bondage. In fact, many prefer the bondage, right? We want to be like the Pharisees and, and set up additional restrictions just so, just so we can do everything we can to avoid getting on, on God's bad side. And listen, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's wrong for us to set up boundaries. In fact, there's wisdom in us setting up boundaries. But, but what's wrong is when we treat those self-imposed boundaries that were set by us as if they're rules that others need to follow in order to be saved. We might say that God's grace is sufficient, but but then we say, uh, we turn around and say, all true Christians must talk this way or or, or walk this way or or vote this way or or believe this way on certain issues uh, or not listen to this kind of music or or not watch these kind of shows. And and some of us, we're like those ex-slaves that uh, we find comfort in staying in the bondage of this man-made system of do's and don'ts. Or we think it's too hard to navigate this life of grace, and so we box ourselves in with these rules. And others of us are like the slave masters, right? And we're enforcing our own rules on other people. And when people outside or when people inside the church break our own man-made rules, I'm not talking about rules in scripture, but our rules that we add to scripture, when people break those rules, then we cast them outside of orthodoxy. Well, if that's us, whether we're the ones that are in self-imposed bondage or whether we're the ones that are enforcing our own list of external rules on the church, brothers and sisters, let me lovingly tell you that, that just like the circumcision party in the book of Acts, we're acting as enemies of grace. And my prayer for you and my prayer for all of us here at the Chapel Nordonia and across all of our campuses is that we would be truly woke to the reality uh, and the implications of grace in our life. Because listen, we're fighting a battle as well. We're fighting a battle that's much bigger than the Civil War. And we're fighting a battle that's not just about flesh and blood. And, and it's a battle that regardless of what side we ultimately fall on, we know that God will be victorious. And friends, God in his grace, in his loving kindness, has given us an invitation, an invitation not just to fight for the winning side, but to be adopted into his family and to be one of his children. And he's given us his spirit to be his ambassadors so that we can fulfill the great commission and so that we can, like he commissioned the apostles, so that we can go to the ends of the earth. And if we want to be a church that's used by God in ways that are bigger than we could ever dream or ask or imagine, then church, it's time for us to wake up to the realities of grace. And once we have this Christ-centered grace wokenness about us, then we need to extend it to others. Because there's more than one kind of grace, right? We're not going to dive into that today. We'll come back to this next week. But there's vertical grace, the grace that God has lavished on us. But then there's horizontal grace, the grace that we should be sharing and extending to each other. And we see this horizontal grace, or really the lack thereof, on full display in the clashing of Paul and Barnabas at the end of Acts chapter 15. But we'll pick up there next week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Father, thank you that we can be called your children. Your grace is so amazing, Lord. There's nothing we can do to earn our way to you, but yet you stooped down to our level and brought us up to you. Lord, I pray that we will just be shaken in this church and awoken to the reality and necessity of your grace. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website, at thechapel.life.